Policy Matters is a conversation platform which aims to provide reasoned analysis and context to the activities, reforms, and policies of the federal government of Ethiopia. Exploring various reforms the government is undertaking, the conversation platform aspires to enable nuanced and informed understanding. Your Excellency Dr. Fizum Asafa, thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to be with us today to discuss the 10-year prospective development plan and policy reform agenda of the Ethiopian government. Um, you and your team have been very busy lately. Your 10-year prospective plan has been approved by the Council of Ministers. Mm. Congratulations for that. Thank you so much. Um, my question to you to start out with is, you know, Ethiopia has had some quite good success in the last mm. decade or so in economic development. Uh, our GDP has been uh, one of the fastest in the world. GDP per capita has improved. Poverty rates have improved. Many different progresses uh, were achieved in terms of infrastructure, both human and social and in uh, physical infrastructure. Uh, so my question is, why was policy reform necessary, uh, which started out with the homegrown economic reform and now is the 10-year prospective plan? Why was it necessary? Yes, as you rightly stated, it, you know, Ethiopia has been registering you know, high uh, growth in the past decade or so, and also the derivatives like the uh, headcount poverty, uh, the per capita income have uh, really showed significant improvement Absolutely. and as well you know uh, the social sector developments like in health education including infrastructure development uh, really showed um, encouraging results uh, but uh, the question is you know um, was the growth is a growth that is, that was felt by every citizen like every household was it inclusive uh, really, uh, did it bring uh, macroeconomic stability in the process? Uh, did it result in uh, structural transformation? So, not at all. Uh, the answer uh, would definitely be not at all. The growth that uh, Ethiopia has been registering for the last uh, decade or so uh, lacked quality. Um, so here uh, I can mention a uh, few uh, characteristics of the growth that Ethiopia has been registering uh, in the past decade. Sure. The first one is it was not inclusive, as I have uh, uh, said earlier. Mm -hmm. There are several questions uh, from the people, from the citizens. In fact, uh, these questions partly are uh, questions of democracy, you know, that relate to the political landscape, but equally important was. Uh, questions uh, pertaining to economic development and in fact the people took it to the streets uh, so it didn't create enough jobs uh, you know several people uh, were displaced in the name of investment and development uh, so the problem was uh, only few participated and benefited and millions uh, were left behind uh, so it was not inclusive at all when we measure it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, the second one is the source of growth mm -hmm. uh, itself. So uh, the growth that uh, we have registered in the past decade essentially came from uh, public uh, investment, and be it in the infrastructure development or other social sector developments, and also uh, projects in the uh, owned by state on enterprises. Uh, so it uh, really ended up uh, creating huge aggregate demand in the economy. Mm -hmm. This was not a problem by itself uh, if you know the supply side followed suit, but it didn't happen. You know the supply side uh, didn't respond accordingly. So production and productivity were very low in the agriculture and in the manufacturing sector. You know export earnings have been uh, stagnant. And even dwindling, you know, uh, in the past six years, especially, uh, yes, structural transformation failed to happen. So uh, the economy also faced, you know, stubborn inflation, mm. uh, and all in all, 
macroeconomic instability. So this was one of the characteristics of the, uh, you know, the growth that we have been registering in the past uh, decade. And again, the way growth and development was financed uh, was not sustainable. Uh, to speak. Uh, so, uh, for instance, the sources and uses of uh, finance uh, for infrastructure development, for projects that were uh, run by the state-owned enterprises was not sustainable. Uh, most of the foreign sources were, you know, commercial loans, which really entail huge interest rates. And again, the domestic uh, finance was also channeled directly and also indirectly through uh, monetary instruments to state-owned enterprises, you know, crowding out the uh, public uh, sector and really affected the, pe the public sector development uh, in that regard. Again, uh, there was uh, also huge inefficiency and corruption in uh, the state-owned enterprises. State-owned enterprises have been, you know, symbol of uh, as I've said earlier, inefficiency, corruption, dead capital, what have you. So these three really uh, <coughs> took the <coughs> economy to, you know, almost full-blown crisis. Mm -hmm. So that was the point where, you know, we had to stop and really start thinking, you know, what should we do and, you know, where should we start? So the economy reached a point where it can't really raise for instance, finance, even if we wanted to. So uh, then the homegrown economic uh, reform okay. came uh, into picture. So if you wanted to continue the same road, you couldn't have because the sources of financing were stressed to a limit. Of course. Um, I see. So what you're saying is essentially uh, the growth was not inclusive, the growth was not sustainable, mm -hmm. and uh, the sources of growth were not... Um, driven by knowledge or, or productivity increase, mm -hmm. uh, which made it uh, questionable that it would continue. Um, those are very good points. Uh, so what are you doing about them would be my second question. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could perhaps tell us a bit about the 10 year prospective plan and the key pillars of that plan, what do you expect to, to accomplish? What are your ambitions? It's a, I understand it's a 10 year plan. Where are we 10 years from now? Yeah, the 10-year uh, plan uh, envisions uh, Ethiopia to be an African beacon of prosperity uh, by 2030. And, uh, you know, having this vision uh, uh, at the top, uh, it has this overarching goal of uh, ensuring shared prosperity, mm -hmm. prosperity in all its dimensions where, you know, every citizen gets, uh, you know, his or share of the cake. Uh, so, this again for this to happen, uh, Ethiopia's economy should uh, stay in the high growth trajectory, mm -hmm. uh, and we targeted to uh, register 10% uh, average GDP growth over the 10 years time, and this will enable us uh, slash poverty by half, and uh, you know register a cap per capita. GDP of 2,200 USD, where we position Ethiopia as uh, you know at middle-income countries level, which is and basically also double the current exactly GDP per capita. Double the current GDP per capita, and also unemployment is targeted to reach uh, mm. to less than nine percent. In fact, other goals are also included on the infrastructure side. For instance, uh, energy generation is targeted to reach mm -hmm. uh, about 20 gigawatts mm -hmm. uh, and along with that you know universal access to electricity in both urban and rural areas and also similarly uh, universal access to safe drinking water in both rural and urban areas over uh, the coming 10 years other goals you know social goals which really touch the lives of uh, our citizens like in uh, human development areas mm -hmm. health education uh, that align with the Sustainable Development Goals, the Africa Agenda 2063 are also included to really improve, you know, lives and livelihoods. So, the, the, you know, the goals include the conventional economic goals and targets and also other 
uh, goals and targets to bring about sustainable and shared prosperity. So instead of just growth, you're looking at broader spectrum of indicators mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that ensure more well-being of the average citizen out there sure. and making sure they're all involved in the system and maybe they take a piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. uh, the obvious question to that is the, the how are you going to do that? So that's the, what are the key pillars yeah. to, to what you hope uh, to push through in the next 10 years? Sure, you know, this is a huge ambition, we can yeah. say that, and the vision uh, looks great and also, yes. you know, uh, a bit ambitious targets, some people say that, but uh, uh, what matters is, you know, the key pillars uh, which were selected really to hold this vision up uh, are really inclusive, comprehensive pillars mm -hmm. uh, that include economic, social, administrative and institutional you know, issues. Uh, there are about 10 uh, pillars in this regard. You know, it, it's worth mentioning really the, these pillars and I really want to uh, list them. The first one uh, talks about quality, economic growth and shared prosperity. Uh, and the second one uh, also can be component of that, but we really want to see that uh, separately as a standalone pillar because we really lack productivity and competitiveness mm -hmm. in all mm -hmm. our sectors, and that's the second pillar. Uh, the third uh, pillar talks about you know, sustainable development financing. That's also where we fell in the past uh, decade, and so uh, this time around, we want to really raise sustainable development financing. The other one relates to uh, technological capacity and digital economy. So mm -hmm. that's also the area that we haven't touched. So that's uh, the fourth pillar. The other pillar uh, talks about really uh, bringing the private sector to the forefront, like the private sector's leadership uh, of the economy and the development. And the other one is building resilient green economy. It has been there, but we have to continue working on that. So our economy should be resistant to any shock, be it natural, man-made, or any kind of shock that we have been witnessing uh, recently. You can uh, see COVID, you know, desert locusts, uh, floods, drought, yeah. Uh, the other pillars uh, relate to institutional related pillars. Institutional transformation should happen if we have to continue growing, you know. Uh, and also the other pillar about access to justice mm -hmm. and public services. The other pillar again relates to uh, development participation, empowerment and, uh, you know, social inclusion. That's also important because the growth that we had registered in the development that came about through that uh, you know, approach was not inclusive, as I mentioned earlier, so that's also important. The final uh, pillar talks about you know, the region. Uh, so Ethiopia is not an island. Mm. It can't develop you know, uh, <coughs> separately. So regional uh, development uh, cooperation and integration, and also building sustainable peace uh, is the uh, last pillar, yes. So regional in terms of the Horn of Africa or the continent of Africa? We really uh, aspire big, but we start small. Uh, so the regional integration as, uh, as in the Horn of Africa should start first. So we uh, have already started integrating through infrastructure, roads, rail, energy, yeah. and then we'll continue with, uh, for instance, the uh, continental free trade area very soon we'll be having, uh, you know, opened up markets, so we want to tap that potential and, yeah. Very well. Um, <coughs> just listening to you, I get the sense that uh, your plan essentially builds on what was working in the past and then really trying to correct some of the issues that were created, but <coughs> also looking at new areas. So my question what I would like to hear from you is, uh, what are the main departure points? So if we take the past policy development processes like the GTP1 and GTP pro GTP2 process, um, your current process, what are the main departure points? Where are the real differences uh, that differentiate you from, from the past? 
Yeah, good question. Uh, yes, I really want to see these departures from uh, three uh, important point of views. Uh, the first one relates to you know the time span itself. You know, uh, we never had such a long term ten year plan, ten year plan. Uh, we used to have three years and uh, five years plan. Uh, so it really helped us to see beyond the horizon of you know a government in office like five years, mm. uh, which we often uh, had before. Uh, so it was uh, really important to make sure this is you know the country's plan, the people's plan, not the incumbent government's plan. That was one of uh, the main departures. The other one relates to the process, as you also uh, asked, like. The process was uh, really, the, I think, one of the biggest departures in this regard, uh, because um, previously our planning experience uh, really tells that mm -hmm. you know plans were made centrally, uh, and that plan <coughs> was uh, really given to each sector as so. This is your plan. Go <laughs> and really work on this, and it was really difficult for um, to get buy-in, even. Really, some uh, sectors really felt uh, left out, and also really didn't want to, you know, work on the targets and the goals because you know it was not their plan at all. But this time around, what we did was we uh, used the you know the bottom-up approach. Okay. In fact, the Planning and Development Commission. Uh, provided the macro framework because uh, no one does that. So the macro framework were given, the important macro indicators, parameters, projections were given. So along with that and hands-on support in the uh, plan crafting process, each sector crafted their own plan and that was one of the departures. And again, um, you know, another one is about consultations and, you know, and, you know public engagement that was also you know, uh, biggest departure. Uh, we had really huge amount of public consultation and stakeholders, you know, engagement. We engaged more than 100 experts, you know, authorities in the area. We gave them the plan. They read the draft between lines. They gave comments and their comments were so substantial that it has changed the plan from time to time. Uh, to really bring it to the level it is now. So this is the second departure. The other one relates to the contents. You know, when I mentioned the pillars earlier, I've said, you know, the pillars uh, include lots of diverse uh, issues from the conventional economic development related issues to institutional transformation, peace, uh, justice. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so the contents were also different from the economic growth heavy issues. Uh, and you know another one that relates to the contents as a departure is the monitoring and evaluation and the uh, accountability landscape we had. So it was so weak that you know no one was held accountable. So your uh, yeah. implementation has been yeah. better thought of. Yes, of I course, see. to make you know, the cycle full, unless, you know, we put uh, really a good monitoring and evaluation system in place, it won't work out. So we really started working on the monitoring and evaluation system along with crafting the plan. And we managed to come up with, you know, a result-based monitoring and evaluation framework. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so um, I'd like to ask a couple of questions, maybe critical factors for success. Uh, one would be structural transformation, the other one being the private sector. So let me start with the first one. Um, Ethiopia has been talking about structural transformation for quite a while now, and the 10-year perspective plan also talks about structural transformation. You plan on moving you know, rapidly large percentage of our population, which is about 73% now, that's in smallholder-based agriculture. You want to move them into manufacturing, into services, and into other higher productivity sectors. Um, you're also envisioning the export mix of the country is going to go from agriculture to more manufactured uh, and higher value added products. This is not going to be easy. So <laughs> how do you plan on achieving it? 
course, it has never been easy. And yes. that's, you know, GTP2, for instance, uh, had that uh, big targets and goals, you know, ambition to really uh, bring about structural transformation, and it didn't happen. And uh, it, it has never been easy in other parts of the world, too. Uh, so uh, we really need to work it out seriously, see the details. Yeah. Uh, so one of uh, really the focuses of the homegrown economic reform, for instance, uh, is really creating that enabling environment so that the structural transformation happens. So uh, the homegrown economic reform, uh, so put uh, forward these sectors that you mentioned like uh, agriculture, manufacturing, including tourism, mining, ICT as uh, focus areas uh, for the coming three years uh, in terms of really removing bottlenecks mm -hmm. and also uh, you know, binding constraints um, in areas of monetary, fiscal policies, structural bottlenecks, sector-specific bottlenecks as well. So uh, we have been witnessing really good uh, progress towards that. Uh, at least in the form of really uh, crafting proper policies, revising policies, you know, uh, introducing new uh, directives and policies on those areas. So the homegrown economic reform have uh, really, um, yes, uh, focusing, have really been focusing on those five sectors in terms of really removing the bottlenecks and unlocking the uh, the potential for structural transformation to happen. So coming to the 10-year perspective plan again, so uh, the reform works that are underway in the framework of the homegrown economic reform will be creating really that level uh, ground for, you know, the pillars that we have set, you know, for the 10-year uh, development uh, plan where we want to ensure quality grows and mm -hmm. the you know what makes growth quality you know is <coughs> one of it is the source of growth and the source of growth this time around uh, have shifted from you know the, the previous uh, you know public sector led construction boom uh, led um, growth to multi sector uh, you know source of growth from agriculture manufacturing and those uh, sectors that were considered as focus areas on the homegrown economic reform. So we'll keep on removing the bottlenecks, you know, and we'll keep on really uh, providing the, you know, the infrastructure, providing the uh, the enabling policies. Um, for instance, you can uh, consider uh, the. Uh, finance sector reform mm. uh, that have been underway in the last uh, couple of years and also the results. Uh, uh, I think that's going to yes. be important. Yes. Um, the, the previous plan spoke of the private sector being the engine of growth, mm -hmm. but um, it said so much that all the money was going to the public sector yeah. instead of the private sector. So I think it's going to be important that uh, the financial sector reform is going to be where everybody's eyes will be yeah. because where the money is going is going to be where the center of the, sure. the, the your policy will be. I guess sure. we'll be watching that. Sure. Uh, I think um, it's it sounds very good. It sounds interesting. And the reforms that are going to sort of remove the growth bottlenecks that will not allow the economy to grow into say diversified sectors, into manufacturing, into higher value added agriculture, that sort of stuff. If you remove those, then the transformation will happen. Uh, so that says by itself, and it is written in your program as well, that the private sector will take the lead now. And the growth is gonna come from the private sector's increase in productivity, rather than the public sector investing in construction projects. That's all well, but uh, we both know that the private sector has not been allowed to grow. So it's still quite young. It's still, um, it's tenacious, <coughs> it's very strong in terms of uh, surviving in a difficult environment. So maybe we will see good days ahead, but mm. it's still somewhat limited. 
how do you plan on then getting growth and achieving some of these mm -hmm. fantastic ambitions that you've laid down to be achieved through the private sector? Yeah, good question. You know, you mentioned it uh, correctly. The private sector is not yet there, especially the domestic private sector. Uh, we have been saying that for long, but you know, the question is, you know, when uh, should it start to be there? You know, sure. and when and because we don't have any replacement for it, do we have substitute? We don't. <laughs> so the private sector should. Uh, really come into the driver's seat. And so when uh, shall we start nurturing it? Yeah. Mm. So that's the question. So uh, now the government really understands the bumpy road that the private sector have been through and we have not been uh, really supportive enough. As I always say, the relationship between the private sector and the government has been complicated kind of relationship the past uh, decade or so. Mm -hmm. uh, so now the government really wants to sm have really a better and a smooth uh, environment for the private sector to have really honored partnership, honored deals, so to speak, uh, transparent deals. So unless we have those, unless we have that honored partnership and deals with the private sector, we cannot really achieve the goals, the ambitions that we set out on our 10-year perspective plan. So for this to happen, as you mentioned uh, earlier, you know, we have to work to develop the private sector alongside really um, mm -hmm. you know, developing the economy. Uh, so for that, one of the strategies um, that the 10-year uh, uh, development plan uh, envisions, envisions to have is private sector development strategy. So we'll soon have that one and we'll start working on it. But uh, again, in the meantime, uh, you know, we have these interim strategies, for instance, the public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really working well, especially in areas of energy and infrastructure. We want to expand that, of course, to other sectors too. So that would really augment the uh, capacities of the private sector, you know, create that um, platform to partner with the private sector and then nurture and really uh, help the private sector to come on board. So that would be one. Uh, the other one is, again, I will mention the homegrown economic reform, you know, mm -hmm. the potentials that have been unlocked for the private sector uh, the past uh, couple of years have uh, been a lot. So still we'll uh, keep on working on them, for instance, in the access to finance, availing uh, infrastructure, you know, the uh, binding constraints, energy, and other sectors, uh, so that's really, really important. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, the private sector really wants to see the, you know, predictable policies mm -hmm. and, you know, priority areas. Um, you know, on incentives only won't really work. So we need to have predictable uh, policies. Uh, that's what we have been doing. For instance, you can uh, refer to the investment proclamation, the new proclamation. It really created uh, lots of um, uh, you know clarities in some areas. Introduced new uh, yes uh, new articles where you know the private sector is encouraged uh, to invest and really. Uh, build the capacity of the private sector in that regard. And the ease of doing business initiatives, you know, beginning from the, you know, the one window services, yeah, uh, and also, you know, the reforms in the state-owned enterprises, you know, the energy sector liberalization, the telecom sector liberalization, the finance sector reform, finance to the, uh, you know, rural uh, farmers and also allowing farmers to use their, uh, you know, cattle, uh, their goats, their camel, mm. you know, the you know the crop on the field as collateral to really uh, raise finance to borrow. This all uh, reform works will uh, enhance the capabilities. You know, will create that enabling environment for the private sector to flourish. And uh, going forward for the long-term, uh, you know, strategic directions. So, you know, the sources of growth that are set out 
on the 10-year perspective plan definitely calls for the private sector engagement. Mm -hmm. That's not the nature of the government really to invest in agriculture, manufacturing sector, tourism. That's the inherent nature of the private sector. So uh, it naturally goes uh, to the private sector. So uh, with proper policies and incentive mechanisms, mechanisms put in place, I think the private sector will uh, definitely take, you know, the driver's seat in the Ethiopia's economy. So one final question for you. Where do you see the role of foreign investors in the 10-year perspective plan? Yeah, as much as uh, we wish and work uh, towards the development of you know, homegrown skills and uh, knowledge in, uh, you know, to sustain Ethiopia's growth and development, uh, we also recognize the role that you know foreign capital know-how technology experience plays uh, you know in achieving the goals that we have set out on our 10-year perspective plan that's why you know you know the reform works that were underway the uh, the last couple of years uh, really did not target only the domestic private sector but also the uh, foreign uh, private sector too uh, you can uh, really uh, take the SOS reform, the liberalization, uh, the opening up of some of the sectors to foreign private like sectors, telecom. telecom, energy. Mm -hmm. So this really shows the commitment of the government really to open up for private, foreign private sector investment. So in uh, the coming years, in the years to come, uh, we really like to see uh, successful partnerships, uh, be it in the form of joint ver venture partnership with the government as well as the domestic private sector, which really tap into the you know, synergies and uh, complementarities and also, as I've mentioned earlier, very transparent, honored uh, kind of partnership with the private sector and that works with, for the foreign private sector too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You have a lot of work to do, so I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you for being with us, Excellency. Thank you so much, Enoch. Sure. Yeah.